Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, CIBC Wood Gundy's Ross Clark tells us what he thinks could happen to the markets in the new year. Former National Revenue Minister and financial expert Garth Turner comments on the Trudeau government's economic policies and a possible GST hike. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Unbelievable harmonies, spectacular performance, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel. Bird Dog and the Vintage Electric Band, Saturday, January 9th at the Alex Goulden Hall. Buy online and save at OnTourTickets.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark, investment advisor at CIBC Woodgundy in Vancouver. Happy New Year, Ross. And the same to you, Jim. And let's hope for uh, a nice prosperous year for uh, all the listeners. Yeah, and no more Black Mondays like we had back in <laughs> August last year. No, uh, no more black swans. Nothing like that, please. But, uh, you know, it's uh, the markets do tend to have some volatility to them, so everyone needs to be aware of that. And uh, Hopefully, uh, we can guide them along the way. Well, they always tell you, uh, be suspicious of any investment that goes up in a straight line or uh, without any zigzags and jags, because that shows you that it's false. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, and the ones that do go vertical, like we saw last year, things such as uh, Shanghai, you know, ends up the year up 7%, uh, but had been up 60% at one time, or or the biotechs, which had that great run into the spring. Yeah, there there is the backside of uh, these uh, exponential moves, and uh, it's it's best to to not be around for those. That saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. <laughs> Very much so. So, so what's so, going to happen here going into the new year? Well, let's uh, you know this is an election year in the United States, and uh, I, I like to look at seasonality. I like to look at. Uh, Things like the 10-year cycle, which uh, didn't do uh, terribly much last year. Last year was supposed to have been a, a good, strong year, but it didn't uh, pan out that way. More of a, a choppy type of year. However, the the normal seasonal on the election, pre-election year was pretty much intact. First half being strong, getting your normal break into the fall, and then a recovery into year-end. So when we look at this year, 2016, um, the norm in election years is that market will become overbought generally in the first couple of months of the year. And rather than the old adage of sell in May go away, you want to be looking to lighten up your positions in the first couple of months of the year because what you end up with is that May historically becomes one of your best buying opportunities of the year. It may not be lower than where we're ending off, uh, where we ended off last year, but if we look through it, you'll find that basically from about April the 25th through June the 1st, you just get an excellent opportunity to to step in. So, I think uh, the uh, the listeners might uh, want to be just, just putting that out on their calendar. Look for some good oversold readings as we uh, get out into uh, the second quarter. And uh, that'll be a place to um, probably look at overweighting in positions. What do you feel is going to happen in the oil patch? Well, uh, sentiment as we finished off the year uh, was was extremely negative. Uh, we had a good turn just around Christmas, uh, coming off the bottom from the thirty-four dollar level up through thirty-seven, and. Um, I would suspect here, oh, and the other thing that we have is we take a look at the uh, the forward rates on uh, the oil complex. And if we look at the difference between the first forward month and the sixth month out, that usually will be around 2 or 3% premium. And it got out into the 10 to 14% level. And that's we saw this a year ago as the market was bottoming out. Uh, took three months of these big premiums in that six month forward, uh, but we we've had that premium kick in once again in, in uh, recent days. And if we look back, I think this is now probably the seventh time since the 1980s where we saw that contango widen out that far. Each one of them became an interim low uh, that was good for a pretty decent rally. Um, doesn't necessarily become the final low. So when I put that together and I look at uh, the uh, 
the oil market in terms of some cyclicality, we find that uh, about every 10 years, uh, we've had an important low. And around the fifth year in a decade, we've had a, a low at the tail end of that, uh, usually in the fourth quarter of the 15th year, early in, uh, in the fifth year, or the first quarter of the sixth year. And this year seems to be have set up for that type of a play. Uh, looking for maybe a rally into the mid 40s uh, in the early part of the year, but back down to retest if not put in lower lows by the time we uh, uh, get through the the next few months. Not a lot happened with gold and silver in the last year. Are they going to make major moves this year? Well, um, the cyclical work that we've got there, there's there's a, an 18 week cycle in the silver market and a 16-week cycle in the gold market. Um, and when those two coincide together as they did at the end of November and they will again at the end of March, that uh, has been um, a good turning point for these markets. So looking forward, uh, if, if we have a point of significance technically, I would say, when we get out to that time window, I would be thinking that uh, we've got the opportunity for putting an important low. Now, this we're coming on five years now since we've had the, the peak in the metals markets, and uh, the bear markets there tend to be either two, three, or five years in duration. So at this fifth-year window, it's it's worth taking a look at. And the if we look at the the move that we had from 2000 up to the top in 2011 on the gold market, uh, we tacked on. We went from 250 in round numbers up to 1923, and we've corrected back just over 50 percent of that so far. Um, the we take a look at the 1970 1975 run and the correction into 76. That had a 50 percent correction, paused at that level for three or four months, and then a deeper correction to 62%, a nice Fibonacci number. Then the 19, the run into 1980, where gold peaked at 875 and sold off through 1982 and 1985, those corrections held at the 50% level, again at the 61, and finally at the fib, final FIB numbers of 76. But that 61% level in both of the last major corrections of the last four or five decades was of major significance and a good turning point. So looking forward to this year, if we were to see gold make that FIB correction, that 62%er, that would give us major support, as I see it, around $890. If we can turn from 890 and get up through the 50-week moving average at some point in the ensuing months, then that to me would indicate that we are putting in our base. And I think that you've got a chance, being the fifth year since the top, that this could be a very, very important low for the gold market. And, you know, other than priced in U.S. dollars, gold has been doing its job for anyone who wanted it as a hedge. If you were in Canadian funds or euros, or the Japanese yen, gold market has held its own for the last two and a half years. So it's it's doing what's necessary there. So um, in terms of the U.S. funds, maybe the dollar has got enough strength that uh, it pushes gold sub a thousand. But I think that once the turn is behind us, we can be looking for much much better levels in the following years. Ross, best of the new year. Best to you, Jim, and we'll be with you for this year. My guest has been Ross Clark, Investment Advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy, Vancouver. If you have any questions for Ross, you can email him at ross.clark at cibc.ca. Coming up next, Garth Turner on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Unbelievable harmonies, spectacular performance, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel. Bird Dog and the Vintage Electric Band, Saturday, January 9th at the Alex Goulden Hall. Buy online and save at OnTourTickets.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Garth Turner, former National Revenue Minister 
and the editor of an extremely popular Canadian real estate blog, greaterfool.ca. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Garth. Hi, my pleasure to be with you. What's your take on the economic policies of our brand new Prime Minister? <laughs> I don't know if we have any yet, actually. Uh, we had our campaign, we had a platform, we've had a bunch of tax changes. Um, I haven't seen much about the economy. Um, so we're going to have to wait and see. There'll be a budget uh, in the new year, and I think that'll be pretty telling. What we're seeing right now is uh, nibbling around the edges of tax policy. Uh, I don't agree with a lot of it, but, you know, a lot of people who are sort of fiscal conservatives don't. Uh, I think rolling back the TFSA contribution was nothing but politically motivated. There was no economic justification for it. Making it harder for people to save, giving them a disincentive to save is just a bad idea. The uh, argument that, oh, well, most people don't do it, so we don't need it, is false because most people don't put money into RSPs either, and we're not going to eliminate them. Uh, it's an opportunity for people later in life to use it. Secondly, I, I don't really like the uh, the new tax bracket being brought in on the rich and that whole spiel we got in the campaign about, you know, we'll tax the 1% and that'll afford a tax break for everybody else. Well, that wasn't going to happen. There's 6 million people expecting a tax break and 250,000 who are getting taxed. That ain't going to work. And, of course, now the government's admitted it. So, you know, i got to tell you, it's a mixed bag right now. I really want to wait and see what the budget's going to say, but I'm, I'm not too impressed with the tax and spend policy. I've heard rumors that perhaps they're looking at a GST hike. Yeah, I think that's a pretty rational expectation. Uh, when Mr. Harper dropped the <clears throat> GST rate by two points, it actually stripped $14 billion out of the coffers of the federal government. That's a huge amount. And, uh, of course, immediately after dropping the GST, we found ourselves in the financial crisis. So it couldn't have happened at a worse time. So the elimination of that 2% added substantially to the national debt. Uh, it helped be us be in deficit for years and years. So you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if Mr. Trudeau is going to inch it back up again. And at the end of the day, from an economic standpoint, a GST is way more sensible than higher income taxes because it taxes people's consumption rather than their income. When you tax what people make, it's a disincentive to be successful. When you tax what people spend, especially in a world that's all freaked out about climate change and carbon and the rest of it, it would seem more like that would be more uh, sensible and equitable. So we'll see, but you know what? Maybe that'll be uh, maybe that'll be in that first budget. Who knows? And of course, usually if a government's going to hike a tax, which is always, as you know, very highly popular, they're going to <laughs> do it. <laughs> they're going to do it early in their term, aren't they? Well, that's right, and that's like increasing the down payment uh, requirement for first-time home buyers. Uh, you know, the, the Harper government couldn't do that, even though the the necessity was there, well, you know, these guys came along and said, let's bite that bullet, let's get it done in the first few months, so they did. And I think if the GST increase is going to come, we should expect it pretty early. Is that hike in the mortgage requirement going to make any difference to the Vancouver and Toronto real estate markets? Uh, it'll make a little bit, not a huge amount. Um, it's, I mean, it's graduated, so under $500,000 is still 5% down. Then between 500 and a million, it's at a ratio of 10%. And then above a million, it's the same as it was, 20%, because there's no CMHC insurance. As you know, you can't buy a garage on the <laughs> most of Vancouver for a million bucks now. We've got an average price of 1.2 in East Vancouver, my goodness, and about 2.6 on the west side. So it's it's just gotten completely out of control. So it's not going to make a huge difference. Um, it may make some. It may bring prices down a little bit. But it's more in the conjunction with other things that are happening that I think you're going to get the impact. And I'm referring there, of course, to a, a weakening Canadian economy. Uh, and it is happening pretty quickly. And secondly, to um, uh, the interest rate increase that we just saw from the Fed, 
which of course is going to ripple through and it may be only a quarter point, but it is symbolic of what is going to happen next. So the combination of those things with the increased down payment, I think, yes, it will inevitably have an impact. And I think we've, uh, I think we've hit the peak price for houses. Do you think raising the Federal Reserve rate in the U.S. will do what they intend it to do? Or, or is it a case of Janet Yellen just saying, look, I'm doing something? I think it will do what they want to do. And what they want to do has not been clearly revealed yet. History tells us that the U.S. Federal Reserve does not initiate a tightening cycle and then give up. They've never done it, and I don't think they're going to do it this time. So the reason that Yellen was so reluctant to pull the trigger, you know, we thought it was going to happen in September and then October, and now it's December. The reason she was so reticent is because she wanted the conditions to be right, and that means that the U.S. economy can sustain higher interest rates, that it will continue to grow despite them, and that they can, can go on this path of the normalization of interest rates, which is probably going to take about two years. So we're going to see a series of increases. They may not be lockstep. They may not be every time these guys meet. It may be once this year, twice next year, three times the year after. Who knows? But it will be a series of rate increases. On average, the Fed has moved over two and a half years for a tightening cycle, and they've done an average of 10 increases over that period of time. So if we're anything close to history, we are going from um, basically zero interest rates to somewhere between two, two and a half, three percent after three years. That may not sound a lot, but it is a lot. And you can imagine the impact on Canadian real estate market, for example, adding two full percentage points to the price of a mortgage. So inevitably, I think that's where we're headed. It's not going to be lockstep in Canada with the U.S. either, but I do think that the U.S. needs to normalize rates or else they're going to end up with asset bubbles. Do you think that the governor of the Bank of Canada did anyone any favors when he just two weeks ago he said, well, if things get bad, we'll bring in negative interest rates? No, I don't think so because, well, he was just articulating the fact that they want to be modern. They want to have the ability to do all this stuff if, you know, things hit the fan, if we had another 2008, and all that's legitimate. But I think by, you know, giving a speech about it as well as publishing a paper on it uh, at a time when he knew that people were pretty sensitive to this kind of news, it was a bad move because it was really misinterpreted by the media and the blogosphere as being, oh, man, Canada's going to, you know, under zero. I'll be able to get a mortgage at the Royal Bank and they're going to pay me to buy a house, which is absurd. There will be no negative interest rates in Canada for the consumer. There's going to be no negative saving rates, no negative borrowing rates. It ain't going to happen, like ever. So the negative rates, people don't understand, is just on borrow, on deposits between the Bank of Canada and member institutions. But still, having said that, I don't even think that's going to happen. So Canada's a pretty soggy place right now. Um, but you look at the dollar, the dollar has dropped off a cliff. It's 71 cents now. And uh, it may well go lower with the Fed move. So uh, this kind of talk in Canada is actually quite unfortunate. Well, some people have suggested to me the loonie could go as low as 55 cents. Yeah, well, I think that's extreme talk, and I doubt it would happen or be allowed to happen. A uh, dollar at 55 cents would be basically uh, a unfair trade practice, uh, and we would be facing serious pressure from our trading partners uh, that we were purposely devaluing our currency in order to sell stuff to the world. Um, that is not a fight that we want to get into or a fight that we could win. So I do not believe the Bank of Canada is going to allow that to happen. So, the, you know, you may know we went down the low 60s there a decade or so ago, decade and a half, um, I don't even think we're going to get that low. I think at 70 cents or just under 70, the alarm bells go off, and we'll certainly be looking for central bank intervention at that point. What can the federal government do if it does hit that? Well, they've got a few tools around. They can uh, they can start buying up dollars. 
um, spending a lot of their reserves, buying up Canadian dollars, creating demand for Canadian dollars. And uh, that is usually a temporary uh, short-term measure that does bolster the value of the dollar. Uh, they can certainly raise interest rates. And uh, that, of course, will instantly uh, bolster the dollar, although it does have ne- negative implications for the broader economy. But they certainly have the ability to do it, and I'm pretty sure that they will. Our new federal government has increased the down payment for some mortgages. I, I know that we've talked about that briefly, but can they really influence people, say, from overseas who are looking at the low value of the Canadian dollar right now, and they take a look at the overall value of real estate in places like Toronto and Vancouver? I mean, they have become international hotspots for real estate, haven't they? Uh, no, they haven't. No? <laughs> I don't buy that argument. I know that everyone in Vancouver, you know, thinks some rich guy from China with a suitcase of money is coming over here and salivating over their houses. And certainly in certain neighborhoods, there's been um, a large amount of investment. But that's the case in Toronto, too. Certain neighborhoods are, you know, very, very Asian, uh, as they are in uh, in Vancouver. And, um, certainly Vancouver has a very large Asian population, but let's not forget that most of it is native, and these are locals. They're Canadians. They're citizens. They're same as the rest of us. So um, I think people have to be careful about that. Um, why would overseas investors want to, you know, pile a bunch of money into housing in British Columbia when the Canadian economy is in weak shape and getting weaker by the day instead of going to the United States where the economy is obviously strong and robust? Beats me. I, you know, I, I wouldn't give that too much serious thought. I know where I'd go with my money. So I don't think that the Canadian investment climate right now is one that is actually going to attract a lot more foreign investment. So, yeah, I just don't buy the argument. Plus, there is no statistical evidence that um, foreign buyers are actually substantially substantially changing prices. Uh, the BC Real Estate Association, the Vancouver Real Estate Board, and all the evidence that I've seen uh, really indicates about 5% or less of overall uh, purchases in the Vancouver, greater Vancouver market are being made by offshore buyers. Um, so you need to question that. And that's consistent with what we're seeing in other markets. In Toronto, it's, it's assumed to be around 3%. In Victoria, it's 1.8%. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a myth, I think. It's an urban myth. If anything, it's perpetuated by the real estate community. And it's there because it makes people think, I better buy now or I'm never going to be able to buy in. So it's been a very effective marketing tool on behalf of the real estate community. But I think actually it's uh, it's wildly inflated. If I'm 25 years old, just out of college, can I still hope to home uh, own a home? Well, if you're 25 and coming out of college, I sure as hell hope you're worrying about other things rather than getting a mortgage. <laughs> it's, it's a weird world we're in today. I, I don't know why people, first thing they want to do is, is get indebted and have property tax bills. I, I just don't get that. But nonetheless, that's the world we're in. It's, you know, house horny and house lusty. And, uh, and I know that young people have been indoctrinated with this thing. But the point is that, you know, should the average person expect to buy a home in a really nice neighborhood of Vancouver with the average salary? No, that expectation is gone. Same as in Toronto. You know, the average price of a single detached home in Toronto is $1.2 million, So, you know, the average person ain't going to buy that house. It's just not going to happen. So people have to uh, be aware of that. I think we've got an unrealistic expectation in Canada. But maybe it's good that actually a lot of people can't because those people who have overreached to buy real estate and gotten in themselves into a massive amount of debt when interest rates were at rock bottom, they're going to have a bitter lesson to learn over the next few years as those rates travel north. So anyone who's taking a mortgage today at 2.5% is going to have to be pretty prepared to renew that mortgage at 5% or better in five years from now. And uh, it's not going to be a happy situation because as mortgage rates go up, real estate prices go down. The only reason real estate prices have gone up over the past five years is because we have seen mortgage costs dwindle 
and uh, that has uh, really brought the cost of carrying houses down. So, you know, at 2%, a $500,000 mortgage, uh, you know, becomes the same as a uh, $400 mortgage at 3%. So people can borrow less, and therefore house prices go down. It's coming. Is that why there's been such a push on Vancouver and Toronto real estate? People are trying to take advantage of low rates? Yeah, people are they're piling in. And I think over the next couple of months, you're, you're going to see um, a, a real little flurry. Um, people are trying to beat what they expect and are going to be higher rates, and that's a good expectation. They're also rushing to beat the down payment requirements, which are going to increase uh, on February 15th, 2016. Um, So this is what we see repeatedly when there are changes coming. A lot of people say, oh, my God, I better get in now when I can still afford it. And, of course, prices go up because there's more activity. People buy in at actually inflated prices, so they're not saving themselves anything. So a wise buyer right now is going to wait. They're going to wait for interest rates to increase, for mortgages to go up in Canada, which they will, and for the new down payments to be brought in. And I think the combination of those is going to moderate real estate prices uh, later in 2016. And, of course, in Alberta, you have the downturn in the oil patch, and that's already had a huge impact on real estate. It has. It's not so much oil. It's employment. Uh, People really don't care if oil goes up or down or sideways, but they sure do care when others are losing their jobs or they're losing their jobs because of that situation. That's what we've seen in Alberta. There's about 80,000 jobs that have been eliminated in 2016, Uh, most of those related to construction or energy. Uh, That's a huge number of jobs. And to make it worse, we've got a socialist NDP government in Alberta, which has raised corporate taxes. It's raised taxes on individuals and two weeks ago brought in a carbon tax. My goodness, Uh, that's a pretty unfortunate combination of things. Um, but, you know, Albertans have done it to themselves by throwing out the last crew and bringing in this crew. So um, I think it's uh, pretty tough times ahead in Alberta, and you are going to see some really massive drops in uh, home values, particularly in Calgary. I was going to ask about possible economic up- downfall or uh, fallout from the Paris Climate Summit. Yeah, it's real. Uh, we don't know nationally what it's going to be yet, but... We certainly got a whole bunch of cheerleading going on for uh, putting a price on carbon. Uh, Our new federal environment minister, uh, she said clearly, you know, expect a price on carbon. We're going to do it. So I think what we'll see shortly from the federal government is a carbon tax or some form of it. Uh, It is going to make gasoline more expensive right across the country, home heating oil, natural gas, electricity are all going up in price uh, and it's going to really add to the burden of consumers. Now, I mean, it's being done in the name of a worthy cause. Climate change is obviously real. It's here. The climate is changing, not not for the better. And uh, over the course of generations to come, it's going to be probably the biggest issue facing man. However, having said that, right now economically, it's coming at a tough time for Canada. I was going to say, is it the wrong time to tackle this problem? Or I guess we've been told there is no time. Yeah, you're you're kind of right. I probably it has to happen. I just hope it happens in a reasonable, sensible way. Commodity prices will come back. We're at a 16-year low right now. Prices are right back to 1999 levels for you know oil and copper and aluminum and grain and all of these things, and it's decimated Canadian uh, industry, and it's a tough time. And But commodity prices will come back. The world still runs on oil, um, and it is probably ridiculously priced right now to where it will be in a few years. So it will come back, but, you know, and when it comes back, Canada will come back. I mean, our Toronto Stock Exchange is down 12% this year, and that's pretty much commodity-related. It's one of the worst performers in the world. Our dollar has been catapulting lower, as we commented. So it is a tough time, and I think for governments to bring in a price on carbon, I really hope they do it gently. Well, we pay four cents a liter more for gasoline in BC with a carbon tax, exactly. and Vancouver has the privilege already of having the highest gasoline taxes in Canada because we also have a transit levy on our gasoline. 
So uh-huh. while other people right now in many parts of Canada are paying around a buck a liter, we're paying a dollar twenty-five. Yeah, but you live in paradise, so suck it up. Yeah, I know. Uh, I was just complaining that there's a light snowfall outside my window, but of course it's <laughs> it, it's not sticking, and the dogs are, are are playing with it, and little kids are having a good time. Well, exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's a friendly snowfall. Yes. Yeah. Well, in Vancouver, though, of course, if Anything white falls out of the sky, it's panic stations, everyone. <laughs> is there any international kind of trend that you're seeing that is showing that Canada's uh, economic future, at least in the short term, is not all that bright? Well, we're uh, we're being lumped in with emerging uh, currencies, emerging, emerging countries right now. Uh, as the U.S. dollar goes up, um, our dollar goes down. As oil goes down, our dollar goes down. Uh, as commodities go down, our dollar goes down. So we're kind of lumped in with, you know, Brazil and Russia and other countries that are oil producers and have what is called the developing economy, <laughs> which is kind of ironic. But yeah, we are, we are on the, the downside of global growth right now. The world is growing. The global economy is growing right now at about 3.1%. Canada's growing at, at best 1%. So we are you know, one third growth in Canada compared to what's happening in the world. And the U.S., of course, is two and a half times our growth rate. Canadians have to understand that. Things are not going well for the economy right now. Uh, and I think our standard of living is somewhat um, under pressure at the moment. So I would encourage people to be smart in their personal lives right now. I think there's going to be a few tough years ahead. That means that they need to be saving more, uh, spending less, reducing their debt levels, not getting into more mortgage debt, not buying bigger houses right now, and they should be investing. And when they invest, they need to make sure that a minority of the assets they have are Canadian and that we have they have at least two-thirds, uh, twice as much in international and American assets as they do Canadian. This is not something people are used to. Actually, 70% of all Canadian investors have 100% of their assets in domestic things. Um, so we have to change that habit. And many investors who've been, uh, who, whose profile looks like that have had a terrible 2015. And I think there's another year of that lined up. What areas internationally are growing? Europe has been great. I mean, Europe's got this giant QE going on, quantitative easing. The European Central Bank is investing 1.1 trillion euros into the economy of Europe because they had some deflationary uh, pressures. So the central bank has moved in there big time, and they're doing well. I mean, the French real, uh, French stock market is up by about 14%. Germany is up by 15%. Um, Japan's been doing really well also, and they've got a uh, a pretty active central bank program going on. And even though Japan's been in recession, um, it's, investors have done very well indeed. And of course, we know in the United States as well. So there's lots of things going on um, economically around the world that uh, investors with a globally uh, diversified and balanced portfolio have actually shielded themselves extremely well from the storm that has hit Canada. Why do the majority of Canadians only invest in Canada? Are are we proud of the nation and feel we should do it, or is it a matter of ignorance? I think it's a matter of financial education. And people feel they don't understand things around the world, and they just don't do it. But ironically, we're in an age today where there's lots of great ETFs, exchange-traded funds that are managed you know, by Canadians or Americans who invest around the world. Um, they're easy to find. They're accessible. You can get these in your own trading account, piece of cake. Uh, and so all those tools are there uh, and, and quite uh, quite handy for folks. So I really think it's just a matter we've had this home country bias. Uh, everybody has it for their own country, but Canadians seem to have it more than uh, anybody else around the world. And this is not doing us a very uh, big favor. I might say as well, in my experience, I'm a financial advisor, um, and I manage quite a bit of money for people around the country, and I see uh, clients transferring assets under my 
care and management, uh, and a lot of them come from bank-owned brokerage houses, and they're almost 100% in Canadian stocks. Um, not a great idea. I know a lot of those banks, they actually work with the company, they help underwrite those companies, they've got involvement in it, there's different reasons why they're going to place their clients into those kind of assets, but I think people who have an all-Canadian stock portfolio, uh, they're really crying the blues right now, and we all know why. Why are the banks pushing the Canadian products so much? Because they own Well, them? yeah, they get a big stake, it's in, it's in their own self-interest too. Um, you know, the, our Canadian banks are heavily involved in every aspect of Canadian society. Uh, they certainly, as I mentioned, do a lot of underwriting of all of these corporations. They are, are key players in the economy, and I think that by directing investment dollars uh, into those assets, it probably strengthens, in their mind, not only their position, but the position of their corporate clients. But it's not always best for the retail uh, investor. And I think little guys... Today, people are saving for their futures and their, their family and their retirement. You've got to be very careful, very careful. Make sure you've got a portfolio that's got balance in it, so safe assets as well as growth assets, and then a high degree of diversification, not only among different asset classes, but also, as we've just been mentioning, geographically around the world. How important is geographic stability when you make an investment? Or, I think or, it's really important. Yeah. You mean in terms of the stability of a certain area? Right, like, like your series and so on. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, yeah, you've got to be careful. When you, when you invest around the world, remember you're investing not in countries, you're investing in companies. So if you have a, you know, an ETF that, that holds Europe and the, the Far East, uh, you're investing in the major companies that are headquartered in those areas. Uh, you're not investing in actually the, the nations themselves. So it's pretty easy for you to kind of Google an ETF to find out all of the major holdings, the weightings in each of these companies, and then uh, you can ascertain for yourself. What's more powerful in real estate, bull and bear markets, fundamentals or psychology? <laughs> oh, with, when it comes to real estate, no, no doubt about the answer to that. It's psychology. Um, you know, people buy houses and they'll do ridiculous things like borrowing epic amounts of money to buy a house just because they think it's cool. And they think it's cool because everybody else wants it and therefore it's a desirable object. Housing is the uh, most obvious example of people making investment mistakes. They want houses when everybody else wants houses. They want, they want houses because they're going up in value. So therefore, they have no hesitation about buying at the top of the market. When houses are unloved and unwanted and prices are declining, buyers disappear. You will need only look at Calgary right now for that or Saskatoon or Edmonton or a bunch of other markets around the country, but mostly in Alberta. So listings have gone up. Sales have gone down, prices are falling, and the buyers have disappeared. Why? Because they don't perceive there's um, rising value. They perceive that there is risk. So you would think that, you know, normally we go shopping for bargains. We look for things that are undervalued and have a good potential of rising. But when it comes to real estate, we do the opposite. So that is based 100% on emotion, and it's why so many people now are going to be so surprised in the years to come. We're speaking with Garth Turner. Garth, we keep hearing of properties being purchased and less left vacant in Vancouver and Toronto by so-called foreign investors. Is that a big problem, or is it a case of people are just worried about that eyesore down the street? I don't think it's a big problem for the value of real estate. I mean, people are free to buy houses and move in or not move in, like big deal. You know, it's a free country. That's their right. Um, I just think that there's this little foreign buyer B that people have got in their bonnets and they just start looking at, you know, these houses that are empty and it's like some kind of problem. But I don't think it's going to impact on the real estate market at all, whether there's a family living in that house or whether it's, it's empty. I just think it's a symbol of people's own uh, preconceptions about the marketplace. And perhaps jealousy that somebody has been able to afford a home. Yeah, well, that's true, but that's always going to be the case. Like I said, you know, if we have this feeling of entitlement in Canada that everybody's entitled to own a single-family home, 
we're always going to have these kind of imbalances in the market, and we're always going to have people taking incredible risks to get things that they actually can't afford. We're in a situation today where the average family probably does not have any entitlement to own a single family home in, you know, downtown Vancouver or 416 area in Toronto. It's just the nature of the beast. The same as people don't expect to buy a single family home in downtown New York it's, or Chicago or Seattle or uh, San Francisco. So it's just, that's the way it is. Um, housing has become more expensive. It's one of those commodities that cheap interest rates uh, right across North America have really inflated in value. Um, so once interest rates go up, once we get back to a more normal environment, then there may be some moderation in the price of housing. But let's remember that ever since 2008, family incomes have been stagnant, uh, sometimes uh, actually declining. Uh, after the financial crisis. So the legacy of the crisis, you know, lousy incomes, low interest rates, inflating real estate values has really exacerbated this situation. It doesn't mean it's always going to be that way, but I must stress that I think that, you know, spending your whole life with the holy grail of getting into a giant mortgage so you can have a home is a pretty, pretty pitiful <laughs> goal to have. How vulnerable are Canadian banks to this mortgage uh, effect? Uh, they're somewhat vulnerable, but not as much as American banks were during the real estate decline that we saw there in 2005, six, and seven. And the reason for that is CMHC. Um, so whenever you have a high ratio, high risk mortgage in Canada, you are forced to buy mortgage insurance. And of course, you're not buying mortgage insurance to protect yourself. You're buying it to protect the lender. So all these home buyers with their CMH, CMHC premiums are actually getting risk insurance for the lender. Uh, we never see default rates go up really high in Canada. We haven't had that experience here as they did in the U.S. And part of the reason is the fact you can't walk away uh, from a mortgage in most of Canada. But in terms of the bank's exposure, um, yeah, they're, they're pretty, pretty nicely protected. But that may change. Um, there is... A lot of talk now about um, banks being forced to have more skin in the game and for banks to actually be paying a big deductible or to have a big deductible in place. So when someone with CMHC insurance actually walks away from their mortgage, that the bank is going to be on the hook for a significant amount as well as the Canadian taxpayer. We'll see if that happens. Are you optimistic that Bill Morneau will be a good finance minister? I don't know that yet. Um, I am heartened the fact that he's trotted out and talked to the media a, a number of times. He's probably done that more in the last two months than our last finance minister, Joe Oliver, did in a whole year. I think Oliver was absolutely a bust. He's probably the one of the worst finance ministers we've had in a long time. So hopefully Morneau is, Morneau is going to be better. He's certainly more accountable. Uh, he seems to speak in a fairly forthright manner. Uh, he is a guy from the private sector. Uh, He's not, you know, he's financially secure in his own life. He's kind of a rich guy. So I think he's doing this for altruistic purposes. And I'm hopeful that he's going to turn out to be a reasonable person. Canada hopes to welcome 25,000 Syrian refugees, a burden on the economy or a bright hope for the future, bringing young people to the country. Well, it will be a, a burden in the short term. It's going to cost two, three, four billion dollars over the next few years to get these people settled and get them brought up to speed in Canadian society. So that's going to come at the same time that the Liberals are saying they're going to launch a giant infrastructure program at the same time that, uh, you know, the cupboard is bare. Uh, we probably had a deficit left for this year by the Conservatives instead of a surplus. So all of those things are going to conspire to have a lot of additional debt and deficit in Canada, and the refugee situation will be a part of it. Having said that, Canada needs more population. We need more people coming in. If we did, if we cut off immigration today, which is only around 250,000 people a year, or 0.8% of the overall population, if we ended that, the population of the country actually would go into decline. And that would not be uh, good for the economy, that is for sure. Your thoughts on a four-letter word people keep posting on your website, gold. <laughs> I've never been a proponent of gold. I think it's it's just a 
a dumb asset to own. It doesn't pay you interest. It doesn't pay you dividends. And it sure as heck hasn't paid any capital gains lately either. Uh, gold hit $1,900 an ounce back in the uh, U.S. back in uh, 2011. I encouraged people at that point to, to bail out and that that was the high water mark. Well, it, it was. We're now $900 an ounce lower than that. So gold people held on to gold at that period of time, had lost 40 to 45% of the value. Now the Canadian dollar has gone down recently, so the American dollar has gone up. Gold is priced in American dollars, so that currency play has helped shield them a little bit. But it would have been the same if you'd held an American ETF or if you just held U.S. cash. So it's not gold that has performed well. It's been the currency. I still think gold is a dead asset to own. There are only two reasons you want gold. One is inflation, which is going to help destroy the value of uh, money, and that sure isn't happening. We're still in a very low inflation world, and we'll stay there. The second reason is financial instability. If you think banks are going to be in trouble or the financial system is going to uh, collapse, then you might want to have an alternative currency. Um, but gold isn't not, and the financial system is completely stable. In fact, I argue that it's far more stable than it was prior to 2008 because central banks around the world are working hand in glove right now to make sure there is stability. So, yeah, I, I just think gold's a dumb thing to hold. If you own the TSX 60, for example, the 60 biggest companies in Canada, if you own that through an ETF uh, like XIU, then you've already got exposure to all the gold miners because they're all there. So I think that's plenty of exposure for the average investor. Garth, thank you very much for being back on This Week in Money and the best of the season. Uh, thank you so much. Well, I hope all our listeners have a wonderful and prosperous 2016. Thank you for having me. My guest has been Garth Turner, his popular blog, greaterfool.ca. That wraps up our show for this week. Thanks to our guests, Ross Clark and Garth Turner. And thank you for listening. Comments or questions for the show can be emailed to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Hope you had a great New Year's Eve. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.